that there is a need for a cure. Uh, we know that despite all the successes of highly active antiretroviral treatment, that um, treatment cannot um, eradicate HIV. And mathematical models have shown that most patients would need heart for 60 to 80 years, or as it was to be depleted if, if they get depleted at all. And factors such as cost, availability, adherence, and um, the impact of drug resistance, the consequences of residual inflammation, long-term toxicities, as well as stigma and discrimination, highlight the need uh, to continue to, to strive for having curative interventions. So first, just to describe the definitions. Um, um, you have probably heard the description of functional cure or remission. Uh, this describes long-term viral suppression in the absence of highly active antiretroviral treatment. Transmission is possible but very rare under these circumstances, and where HIV viral loads um, remain below uh, level of detection of 50 copies, RNA copies per mil. Um, eradicating cure or sterilizing cure is the elimination of all HIV infected cells uh, so that there will be no replication competent virus. Um, this requires no need for further treatment. Um, HIV RNA, um, in terms of viral load measures, are considered as less than one copy. Um, and that's considered as cure. In the case of the uh, functional cure, uh, there are examples of, of transient and more sustained um, functional cure or remission. Um, and uh, Mississippi Baby is one example, and post treatment controllers, they mentioned in the the data. Uh, lead controllers serve as uh, an ideal model for the study of trying to understand the characteristics that define functional cure. Um, as they uh, naturally control HIV replication to less than 50 copies per mile. Um, the burden patient obviously being an example of a uh, total um, cure. That is really what um, sparked um, the renewed interest as, uh, in terms of, of trying to find the possibility of HIV eradication. And this provided the first concept that HIV can actually be cured, and this was through bone marrow transplantation um, that uh, Timothy Ray Brown had. Um, with an HLA matched CCR5 delta 32 donor. So the donor had no CCR5 expression on, on the donor's cells, and um, this is thought as one of the factors that, that may have contributed um, to what now is considered only individual with uh, total cure. So we know only one person has been cured, so it's possible, um, although not practical in approach. Um, but transient remission is also possible. Um, and this particular slide shows um, generally a, a typical person who has been on treatment for a while um, will usually rebound within a couple of weeks. Um, there have been two more examples of the Boston bone marrow transplants, also transplant individuals, but they did not receive um, um, cells from anyone who did not have CCR5, so that was one difference. Um, they, however, did rebound, um, but they had a delayed um, uh, rebound and they had a mission all part at three or seven months. And in the case of a Mississippi baby who um, was treated early within 30 hours of infection, was lost to follow up at about 18 months, um, remaining with off treatment, and um, experienced a period of remission or part uh, for 27 months. And although that ended up being a disappointing result, I think it is still remarkable um, that there was remission for that period of time. Another group of, of interest is um, post-treatment controllers. Uh, a good example of that is this Conti cohort. Uh, they, till today, have managed to, following early treatment, um, retain um, undetectable viral loads um, now in excess of, of seven years. So why can HIV not be cured with the current therapies? Well, HIV persists in a latent form in different cellular and anatomical reservoirs. And the latent form would be described as being transcriptionally inactive in the cell, as well as but replication competent. So with the potential to be induced to actually come out of the cell and, and cause further infection. Um, HIV also persists both in blood but also in tissue. So there are a lot of other reservoir sites, um, the gastrointestinal tract, the genital tract, the central nervous system are examples. Um, but the problem is being that antiretroviral treatment, as well as the host immune response, are ineffective at eliminating the reservoirs. Major reservoir cells at harder latency um, in vivo are resting in the C4 T cells, and they're either known to be of the central memory um, type or the transitional memory um, type of cell. 
But latent infection, and obviously the, the major emphasis and the major studies are, are, and, um, are looking at various T cell subsets, as they're the major reservoir cells. But latent infection can also be established in other long lived cells, uh, naive cells, bone marrow progenitor cells, thymocytes, astrocytes, and then also other cells uh, of the monocyte macrophage lineage um, can support long lived, low level uh, productive infection. So what is quite interesting is that if one looks at with age, uh, firstly memory cells are your most abundant lymphocyte population. They're predominantly quiescent. They're capable of intermittent self-renewal. They have long-term survival, um, some longer than others, and they're very heterogeneous. And also what happens over time is that with age, you have these very dynamic differences and uh, changes that take place in the frequency of your memory T cells with age. Uh, so this particular graph shows that you have three phases. You have memory generation, which really happens within your first two decades. Um, you have this sharp increase in your memory T cell subset. Um, sorry, the top um, uh, graph, the, the blue line, is really the total memory T cell complement um, in, in the body, and that includes the blood, the intestine, skin, and the brain, and the tissue. Uh, the circulating memory T cell pool is the, the memory T cell pool that we usually measure um, in blood. Um, and you can see that that sharply increases um, in, in, um, up to the age of 20, and then you have your um, more memory homeostasis period, where it level, levels off and plateaus, and then you also start having a decline uh, greater than 65 years of age, as you know, where you start having luminescent uh, features of, of T cells. But the one thing that's very important to note is that the peripheral blood only contains about 2 to 2.5 percent of the total T cell complement um, that is present in the body, and that is the, the source that we're always looking at, um, which also makes one question: um, what lies beneath the, the, the enormous um, potential for a memory cell pool in other reservoirs that can be contributing uh, to the challenge of, of curing the Chinese. Um, the pathway of T cell differentiation, so aside from just the numbers of cells and, and where they reside, um, is little, and it's, it's not, not full understanding, um, it's not well understood in humans, um, but this uh, particular uh, schematic really just shows different um, um, particular T cell subsets, um, going from naive T cells, and in the presence of antigens or any stimulation, they form um, in what is considered or thought to be maybe a linear um, differentiation pathway, where you then have your stem cell memory, um, which are very, very long lived cells, um, although they're in very small in number, are also cells that have been um, shown to be quite important in terms of reservoir cells for HIV. Uh, your central memory cells, um, some of these, um, then they have different, different trafficking abilities, some go to lymphoid tissues, some go to peripheral tissues, and then you also have uh, tissue resident uh, T cells. All these cells are functionally different, um, and they also serve, so they, they contain different markers, and they, um, um, and they serve as, as reservoirs for HIV. So adding to the complexity, and this is really just to show that um, these cells are very, very heterogeneous, um, and they also diff differently distributed in blood and in tissues. Um, and they obviously have different markers, they have different abilities to produce various cytokines. Uh, but superimposed on this is if one thinks of viral processes such as replication, latency, and then reactivation from latency. Those are all processes that are very dependent on the cellular composition. So your cell type, your subset, the state of your cell, whether it's resting or whether it's dividing, the nature of latency, um, which is a complex, uh, uh, latency is complex in, in its own right, and then obviously the extracellular environment. So various stimuli that you have and the exposure time to those stimuli. So there are a lot of factors that play into enormous complexity that then sort of underlines the, the host virus uh, interaction. One looks at persistent infection, um, this particular graph just shows that um, once you implement high antiretroviral treatment, they are they considered that there are four phases of viral decay, and that those phases actually correspond with half-lives of the different cell populations of the different T cell subsets. Um, so you can see that your um, level of detection of most of your clinical assays is shown there as uh, 50 copies per ml. Below that is what people consider as the residual viral year, which usually can be measured if you use um, more highly sensitive viral assays that detect to less than one copy per ml. 
Um, and using those types of assays, it's been shown that at least 80% of the HIV infected individuals on heart, on suppressive heart, will contain about two to three copies um, of the RNA uh, per mil. Um, so still having detectable residual viral here. Um, so you can see at the bottom, the, the little the yellow dots really indicate the activated T cells. Those are the ones that die off most quickly. Um, and then you have that sharp decline in, in your viral load. Um, then goes on to uh, partially activated T cells, the green ones. And then the blue cells are really showing the rest of the memory cells. So these are all the cells that are much more long-lived. Um, and the central memory transcending effect and totally differentiated cells. And then the blue cells are very really long-lived ones. Um, the same, same groups of, um, of cells, and it's particularly those cells that are going to be a challenge in terms of, of eliminating in, in heart suppressed individuals. So how does one measure a persistent HIV with respect to, to virus measures? And on the left hand side, it uh, shows a latently infected cell, productive infection on the right. Um, so we know we can measure external RNA with our viral load assay, so that's what is being produced by the cell. Another way of measuring productive infection is uh, with co-culture methods. Um, latent cells can also be induced to produce uh, replication competent uh, virus. That's really considered as the gold standard of showing that it's actually uh, replication competent, but you're, you're, um, um, whereas any of your other measures are, are really detecting either RNA or the DNA. Um, your other RNA measures are cell associated RNA, and this is either in the form of unspliced RNA or it's, um, a multiple spliced RNA. And what usually happens is that that ends up being a better indicator of productive infection rather than latent infection, as uh, the, the versions of unspliced RNA are, um, are not really detected in latent infection, um, and multiple spliced RNA is not transported uh, effectively in, in, in latent infection. Either. Um, the, the, most, uh, the easiest measure is the measure of HIV DNA. Um, that measures total uh, DNA, HIV DNA in the cell. And that's the one that's uh, probably the easiest to use in clinical trials. Um, however, that does not distinguish between defective virus or the provirus that can be activated or not. Um, the two LTR circles, so that's um, the long terminal repeat. Um, you have two components of the circle that forms an episodal form in cells. It's usually indicating the existence of a continued productive infection. So it can serve as a marker of having underlying productive infection. Um, integrated DNA can also be measured um, in, in um, directly um, in cells. Um, however, that particular assay uh, requires, it's quite labor intensive, it requires a nested uh, physiological step that's also um, um, as, you know, makes it more complex and expensive. So the one that's, that's probably most popular is the, the HIV DNA. But again, um, a combination of many of these assays is, is ultimately what's needed as markers for, for determining virus. Um, just to give you an idea of some of the, the cure strategies that, that are um, an, an under intensive investigation, um, and the one is intensification of, of heart, uh, plus or minus other interventions. Um, also the early initiation of heart, which is probably the one that we know most about at present, and this is with the aim of limiting virus reservoirs at the outset. Improved drugs for uh, penetrating anatomical compartments, uh, reactivation of HIV replication from latent reservoirs. Um, this is the kick and kill, or the shock and kill um, approach, um, and this involves various latency reversing agents to try and um, purge HIV from cells. This would then require a common, either the immune response would then take out the rest, or it would require additional um, approaches such as broadly neutralizing antibodies uh, by specific antibodies, um, therapeutic vaccines. Um, obviously, gene editing therapy is also of interest, an example of being zinc fingers to disrupt the expression of CCR5. Um, and then also various um, um, interfering with uh, immune modulators or um, using. Uh, experiment in logical mechanisms. Uh, so, like IL 7 is an example of it. And then I mentioned therapeutic vaccines to enhance um, immunity um, and then various um, antibody approaches. So, timing of art initiation in acute infection and, and, and reservoirs. We know that HIV is established very early in acute infection, it's even considered to happen within days. 
um, and really it establishes itself, like, HIV persistence establishes itself in long lived memory CD4 cells. Um, when instituted early, it is known that, it, uh, that the um, treatment in acute infection can reduce the HIV reservoir size to a much greater extent than when treatment is given in chronic infection. Um, but again, it persists in, in memory CD4 cells in most of your treated patients. There's also recent data to suggest that in the very early stage um, of um, acute infection, um, this may protect central memory cells from infection and actually skew the distribution of latently infected cells to the shorter lived memory cells. Um, and this is something that seems to occur in, in um, post treatment controllers as well as elite controllers. Um, so, certainly, it is considered that antiretroviral treatment in early infection may be the very first critical step in the path to achieve remission um, by containing the, the seeding of the reservoir prior to instituting at a later stage interventions that may be able to eliminate um, or eliminate the affected cells. So, this just gives an example. Again, just the, the top is showing the, the, the spectrum of, of um, CD4 T cell subsets. And you see the example at the bottom showing in chronic infection, just the representation of having more of all of these cells, um, and that that latent reservoir is reduced over years of art. Um, and then showing the situation of acute infection, where you limit your reservoir at the outset, and then with years of art, ending up with a much more uh, diminished latent reservoir. And the latent reservoir there, you can see, is, is mainly considered your stem cell memory and your central memory subsets. Um, rather than uh, shorter lived uh, versions. So what about post-treatment controllers? So the Viscality cohort, um, just as an example, um, at the bottom I put there's a number of other reports on post-treatment controllers, and this is uh, the one that's the most famous. They started therapy within 10 weeks following primary infection. Uh, we're on therapy for 36 months, uh, followed by a year of 89 months. So they've been infected for now over seven years. Um, with um, control um, of therapy. So what are the characteristics of these patients? Uh, they're nothing like HIV controllers um, from a genetic perspective. Um, they lack uh, protective HMAB alleles um, that are overrepresented in, in HIV controller groups. They generally have poor CDA T cell responses, whereas this is usually um, very strong CDA T cell responses are experienced in, in uh, elite controllers. And, and other long-term non-progressors. Um, they have more severe primary infections than controllers do. Uh, the incidence of viral control after interruption of early life uh, tends to be higher in, in the group uh, compared to spontaneous control individuals. So it is a subset of individuals um, that is quite interesting to, to, to think about. They maintain a low reservoir, and in some, this reservoir is reduced to very, very low levels. They also have very low T cell activation. So that, but the mechanism very clearly is that viral control is different to that that is observed for individuals that naturally control in the absence of art. Um, this is just a, um, an add-on to some work that done on the Visconti um, uh, cohort. Um, and really what this showed was that they have very specific natural killer cell phenotypes that have a high anti-HIV capability and that this may be one of the factors that may contribute to their ability to control subsequently. Um, the figure really just shows that certain of the receptors, I'm not going to say what they are, but they, a number of receptors that you find on natural killer cells are, are increased. They see 160 negative, um, so they actually have a low, and that indicates low cytotoxic uh, ability, so they've got a, a lower sort of killing ability on the, that, that particular subset. And they also have low um, NKP46, which is also an activating NK cell receptor. Um, but they have the ability to produce one more interferon gamma, um, which is a good cytokine in terms of, of, um, of immunity. Um, it does raise the question of what other cytokines might be involved and exactly how these cells are very effectively having the capacity to kill HIV um, autologous infected cells um, in vitro. Um, um, I would think that uh, certainly some of the CC chemokines would possibly be, be in, in question. Um, and the thing that's really interesting here is to, to perhaps ask the question on any genetic characteristics about this particular subgroup of individuals um, that may help us to be able to predict who might be individuals um, that could achieve uh, this type of sustained remission. So, elite 
controllers um, who control naturally, um, as I mentioned earlier, then the model for functional cure. Uh, some of the characteristics that have been associated with them is generally virus fitness has not been shown to be a major factor. So it's not mutations in the virus or defective virus that seem to play a role. Um, we know they have small reservoirs. Um, they've got strong, in general, strong HIV specific T cell responses. They have favorable HNA types. Um, neutralizing antibodies are not a major factor. Antibody dependent cellular cytotoxic responses are elevated. Those are responses that utilize antibodies to, um, when natural killer cells or non cells use antibodies to bind to um, HIV infected cells and, and kill them. Um, and enhanced activity of myeloid uh, dendritic cells, so part of the innate system that seems to be very much um, um, seems to be very um, um, prominent. And then also increased production of various uh, uh, cytokines such as IL-21. Um, so the one thing is, I mean, youth control is obviously a very small group. They've been estimated to be maybe one in 300 HIV infected individuals. I'm not sure how that, um, that would translate to different populations. Um, but there are long-term effects um, in the heat controllers, for example, a progressive loss of CD4 in some, um, and there is ongoing virus replication and evolution, as one can see from the virus sequences where individuals have been able to, to look at virus, and your immune activation has also increased. Um, however, that, that one has also raised, the question has been raised whether these individuals are not also be the best candidates for testing sterilizing cure strategies. This given that they really have very good immune responses and that uh, any cure strategy uh, could then also rely on, on um, the, 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 the immune response uh, capability. Uh, just to give you an idea of some of our long-term progresses in immune controllers, just to show you, just to give you an, um, an idea of the types of um, factors that we see in them. I've got genetic factors on the left, so immune responses on the right. Uh, the group of long-term non-progressors and elite controllers. Um, I, there's, there's 10 black individuals, um, four Caucasian individuals, and the progressors are all the black individuals. Um, elite controllers are marked in red. Um, and in general, if one looks at the left-hand column, and, um, guys on the other side, <laughs> um, the HLAE in general, you can see um, um, Protective alleles um, I'm marked as pink and blue for deleterious. So if you've got a good HNA, um, you've got pink, if you've got two copies of, of a good HNA, you'll see like number nine, for example, and number 11, um, you've got, got two <coughs> copies, one from mom, one from dad. Um, that, um, so you've got a lot more good alleles than bad alleles. And your progresses, you can see a lot more blue coming up. Um, HLA-C1, um, that's one of the categories of HLA-C alleles. Um, that we've shown previously, and another group is also showing African populations um, that this plays a role in. Um, if you have one of those alleles, you are more likely to have a lower viral load. Um, you can see this is more highly represented in the long-term progressive controller group, a lot less in the progressives. Uh, CCR5 is quite interesting. There's a lot of um, protective um, haplotypes. Um, so the A haplotype is one of the protective ones, the deleterious haplotype is the e haplotype that's very uh, prominent in, in African individuals. Um, and you can see a lot more pink again um, in terms of CCR5 and the deleterious. We don't have any Delta 32 amongst the Caucasians. In fact, they have the protective type that's quite rare in Caucasians but is much more prevalent in black individuals. Um, three of the four individuals have that one. Compared to the normal population, we only find about 4% um, frequency of that particular male. Um, in terms of immune responses, um, in general, they've got very good HIV-specific T cell responses, both CD4 and CD8. But there's a spectrum of magnitudes and breadth, so they're very variable. Um, and they, they range from being the strongest responses we've ever seen to individuals who actually have no T cell responses. Um, as you can see, individual number 8 doesn't have an NK response and doesn't have a T cell response at all. Um, the natural killer cell responses, um, these are um, responses that we detected and described in whole blood um, a few years ago, um, and they're usually to the envelope region or to regulatory pools of, of, of HIV. That's where we pull NPR with um, all the regulatory and accessory genes together, <coughs> sorry, peptides together. Um, and you can see that's very, very dominant in, in that particular group, and um, progressives hardly have, have any 
Um, previously, when we described these responses, it was in the context of mother to child transmission, um, where we showed that non, uh, non transmitting mothers had very significantly higher um, proportions of, uh, significantly higher proportions of non transmitting moms um, um, had these responses, as well as um, we found them exposed and infected infants, and very rarely. Some of the other characteristics um, is that they, um, they um, when we compare this particular group to healthy controls, we actually, obviously, they feel, as we expected, T cell activation levels are higher. But what did really stand out was the CCR5 density in this whole group was significantly down, um, both on T cells and monocytes, uh, compared to healthy controls. And that was kind of quite unexpected. So we see this as an increase in T cell phenotype. Um, Although um, CCL5 positive C8 T cells are increased, and that makes sense if you've got increased T cell activation, uh, you usually find expansions of, of CCL5 positive C8 cells. Uh, soluble CD14, uh, this is usually a measure of monocyte activation, um, um, was not significantly different from healthy controls, so that's not a major contributor to the activation. And then various other cytokines we saw elevated, um, pushing more towards the Th1 type of immune response. So nudity in early life, uh, just switching to, to uh, the pediatric situation, um, there are a number of factors that may limit or favor HIV persistence. So some factors that might actually decrease the likelihood of persistence is the fact that you've got very few memory C4 T cells. You've also got fewer activated C4 T cells. You've got higher levels of CC chemokines. This is just both in, in plasma as well as um, the ability of neonatal NK and C8 T cells um, produce um, or suppress HIV to a greater extent than adults do, and this is actually through the production of CC chemokines. Other factors that, um, and sorry, just on the right, I've just shown a, a graph that shows CCL5 positive CD4 cells and how important that they virtually not detectable, and then obviously with increasing age um, up to adults, um, you get this, um, this increase over time. Um, also just showing the very dynamic changes in cell success that you have with age. Um, factors that increase persistence is the abundance of CD4, CCR5 T cells in the gut. So even though in the peripheral blood, very early in life you see no CCR5, you see massive amounts of these cells in the gut, and this is considered to be the, the, the reason uh, why they may actually be more susceptible to infection. Um, they have immature innate and adaptive immune responses, and then you know that children have much higher myelinia. Uh, but there are also memory like T cell, uh, T cells that you can find in the blood, which may aid in the virus taking on. We know that early art in children um, improves survival, uh, influences virus control once they're on antiretroviral treatment. Um, there have been studies that have shown a reduced reservoir size if you have early treatment. Um, that's with all the measures I mentioned earlier, integrated DNA, total DNA, to MTL circles and RNA measures. Um, also, there's the reduced uh, detection of HIV-specific responses. So, um, and something that's been found is that when children are tested later, if they started early treatment and then they find beyond uh, many years later, um, there are no detectable <coughs> um, and often no detectable T-cell responses. Um, and um, immune activation is also reduced with, with early treatment. Um, just to run very quickly through some of the cases of early treated infants, um, looking at the issue of transient um, remission. Um, obviously, the best known example that everyone knows about is the Mississippi baby receiving up to 30 hours. I'm showing an example of three babies here that had transient remission for various times. Um, just to see if we can get some handle on what the markers might be on rebound. Um, the Mississippi baby um, had undetectable viral load within a month. Um, as I said before, um, it was in care for 18 months, and then uh, 27 months off heart uh, was undetectable, uh, but rebound then. Um, the Canadian baby um, started out to 24 hours, um, reduced to 6 months. Um, again, virus rebound occurred sorry, in both those two babies, 2 to 3 weeks following out. Um, all three had undetectable HIV DNA and replication competent virus and HIV antibody. But one thing that stood out, um, the Canadian baby had detectable um, HIV-associated RNA, cellular um, RNA, 
um, and the blown baby had high activated T cells and had evidence of HIV C T cell um, responses. So those indicators are ones that usually show uh, some evidence of ongoing replication. Um, just to mention, there are four NIH clinical trials that are going to be uh, running that will ask the question if early R initiation soon after birth can lead to remission of HIV, such that children will stop treatment for an extended period of time. Um, these are taking place in various countries, in South America, North America, um, in Africa, um, and then our one in Johannesburg, the trial, and then in Thailand. And then obviously the mark, as I've mentioned, will be tested very um, with slight differences across the various trials. So what are the challenges? Well, we certainly know identifying it's not easy um, to be implementing early treatment in infants. Um, obviously the relapse rates have decreased. Um, in utero infection, um, we also don't know how long children have been infected um, at the time of birth. Um, also mentioned previously in the dynamic changes in cell subsets at the time, and um, also seen volumes of the units. Um, just to say a few words about um, um, we look at the host genetic variability. Um, the human host is, um, in Africa has been described as unprecedented genetic diversity in Africa. And that's going to affect a whole lot of um, outcomes and, and phenotypes in terms of susceptibility rates of disease prevention, etc., adjuvants, vaccines, and obviously in the context of what we're talking about, response to cure interventions. And we can expect these to vary much more widely in Africa than elsewhere. Um, sex differences are not intact um, to any great extent. Women tend to have lower burdens of bacterial and viral and parasitic infections, but their prevalence of autoimmune diseases is higher. Um, and um, there are differences in that women usually um, have better, um, lower viral loads and higher significant counts of earlier infection, um, but they progress more quickly at lower viral loads. So ultimately, they have similar time to AIDS in, in them. But there's, so obviously, there's a difference there, and that may affect the types of um, the, the, the uh, responses that we, we get from, from cure interventions. Um, also, there's higher T cell activation in women, they have more frequent R side effects and discontinuation of treatment. So in summary, um, we've got very, we know very little um, about the potential of demographic factors in terms of safety and efficacy of curative interventions. And if anyone's interested, this particular systematic review is, is, is quite um, an eye-opener um, and looks at studies from 1991 to 2011 um, to look at participation in care studies. Um, so the conclusion was that Participation in care studies does not reflect the burdens of infection in women and older adults and in young whites, and most of the studies have been largely conducted on young white males. Um, only 23% of 151 publications reported any demographic data, and only 6% conducted um, efficacy analyses. So this is information that probably exists, and, and we could certainly gain a lot of insights from just using um, what we're probably is there. Um, and just to reiterate, we've got very limited um, information on the establishment of reservoirs. These are big needs. Um, we need to know um, about reservoirs and tissue compart um, compartments. We need continuous development of assays for many of cellular and tissue reservoirs that are accurate and sensitive, produced and standardized. Um, and we, we do need to find additional markers that help to predict these cure outcomes. Resource limited settings, additional challenges, obviously, compared to high income settings. I think all the previous speakers have touched on many of these factors. Um, responses of interventions are likely to be different. Virus traits are different. Other co-infections, it all complicates that landscape. Um, treatment in early and acute infection and pediatric studies are feasible, um, but again requires early diagnosis, early treatment, subsequent monitoring of, of sustained suppression. All technically possible, but each is their own life representing a challenge. Um, we also need to consider the very large numbers of HIV infected individuals who started antiretroviral treatment beyond an acute infection stage, and these would pose an even greater challenge to, to the cure strategies. And then, just to say, we need to continue to strive towards the goal um, of, of trying to attain HIV cure um, as we have all this individual public health benefits. And then, just to acknowledge.